Join me in prayer as we go into our message time here at Elevating Life Church. Let's pray. Lord, as always, we are in awe of you and praise you for the ability to stay connected to your vision as, as seen in the Garden of Eden. And we do say sorry for losing sight of it in our lucky and charming ways. We ask for mercy to reconnect with your way that guarantees an intended and mature reality. A reality that reflects who you are through your Son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, good morning, good morning. What a pretty crowd this morning. We are looking good. Hey, today we will begin our message in the book of Jeremiah. That's the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 29 continues our year's theme, Understanding the Bible, God's Epic Story, as Harvey prayed. Now, it is great to be with you uh, on this. Can I, can I share this with you? I don't know if you know this uh, or not, but it is great to be with you on this National Pigs in a Blanket Day. Yeah, uh, hence the pink shirt. You probably thought it was after Easter, but I thought this would be fitting on National Pigs in a Blanket Day where I guess we're encouraged to wrap a big pig in a blanket or a shirt like I have, kiss them right on the nose if you want, and where people get to watch it and laugh together because we all know this, we're just more better together, right? Amen. Who's with me? All right. On three, by the way, everybody say more better together. One, two, three. Man, there's a mighty crowd right there. That sounded good. Now, for those who may be wondering who I am, I see some new faces here. My name is Drake, uh, one of the pastors here at the church, uh, senior pastor at Elevating Life Church, and absolutely thrilled uh, that you're, you're here. Hey, let me say welcome. Welcome to our guests. Welcome to our regular attendees and our members, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And, and let me share. I am absolutely thrilled, as always, to be sharing God's Word Today, we're going to, I'm going to share a big lesson here, a gist of God's Word today, and I'm thrilled to be doing so. Now this week, uh, we are in our third series out of seven for the year 2022, where we're looking at now how people continue, and isn't this crazy, people continue to, to choose to escalate uh, the fundamental problems of life. And it's, it's a way where people continue to define life their way, which, which is scary if you think about it, if you think about most people's life and who they are, rather than God's way that leads to or down, or I should say up a good path. And so this series is connected with the second series is about man's problem, but this aspect, this series is about how we continue to escalate the challenges or problem and continue to live in our, let's say, greasy rag way. Now it's sad because uh, when choosing the wrong path, uh, it, it's, it's negative, it's wrong, right? And let me say this, it's sad because it's so avoidable. It is avoidable. So today we will be exploring Two different paths, if you will, or plans of living. One that continues uh, to lead people to death through, let me put it this way this morning, through luck and charm. And the other, a way that directs people to a thriving existence, uh, a reality that promises a noble and magnificent uh, fate or destiny. It's two paths that we have a choice or we can choose to be on. So today's topic is how religion and spirituality actually work well together when doing it God's way rather than depending on the luck and or charm in a message that I've titled Lucky Charm Religion. And I wish I had cereal right now because this would be an awesome. Just throwing lucky charms at you. But I didn't think that far ahead. It's magically delicious. So with that, read with me our opening verse to understand where God, excuse me, where good fortune and fate, destiny, stand together, ensuring God's plan squashes the luck and charm of, of the world's religious system every time. 
So read with me Jeremiah 29, 11. A very familiar verse for most Christians. Here, Jeremiah, of course, is the writer, is our character today, but in the voice of God. Uh, Jeremiah shares this again in the first person voice of God. For I know the plans. Notice that word know. It doesn't say I know the luck in the, in the, in the good looking people that are going to whatever. For I know the plans I have for you, declares mom and dad. Declares the boss. No, declares who? And is that in small caps or all caps? That's Yahweh. That's God the Father, God's perspective, God the Son, His character, and of course, God the Holy Spirit, which we just sang about, which is the movement that goes with that in living a life that goes uh, with that good path uh, in, in that way I mentioned earlier. So again, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper. I need to pause here because there's this new uh, theology out there called prosperity the, uh, theology. Anybody hear of this? It's kind of a movement that's happening. This is not what this is talking about. What that is, is you get into the faith hoping that you'll become uh, wealthy in the sense of practical, where that you're in it to, to be, you know, gain the money and the, and the things. Uh, that's not what <laughs> prosperity means. Even though it could be, God could bless you that way. It means to thrive in life. No matter in the good times, bad times, no matter what you have. So here, Jeremiah, in the voice of God, is plans to prosper you, thrive, not survive, and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Well, I hope this, th these opening words grab your heart, your attention this morning. Because it is what will keep you focused in the faith if you believe it, you put the proper attitude toward it, and you have a lifestyle that lives it out. So here's our opening verses, uh, verse today, Jeremiah 29, 11, to begin our message once again called Lucky Charm Religion. Now, with our core verse shared, I have a question for you. Here it is. Here's this week's question. And it's so simple, but something to think about. Do you have a short-term or long-term dream for your life? Let me ask that again. Do you have a short-term or long-term dream for your life? And what I mean, a short-term dream being a small plan based on the world's luck and charm. Or... Uh, what I mean by long-term, a long-term dream being big plans as the Lord declares them for your life. So again, I have to ask the question, do you have a short-term or a long-term dream for your life based on God's word principle? Which is it? Is it, it's one or the other and how focused were, you lean one to the other. And if it's leaning the wrong way, I promise you, you're going to end up in, in, in a nothingness faith as we see in Jeremiah's day. Which is it? Uh, again, uh, we have to answer that question. Now, unfortunately, for many, it's the former. It's short-term dreams. Oftentimes we get goals mixed up with dreams. Where religious experiences, let's say, are scattered here and there. Perhaps people go to church on Christmas and Easter and one other time. Scattered, you know what I mean? We call these folks the CEO Christians, if you will. Again, most people are living in their, in their faith that way. It's quite sad. So we got where religion is experienced and scattered here and there with luck and charm as their strategy. Plans that put them in survival mode, where hope is diminished and uh, their outcome and fate turn out in the long run to be empty and or nothing in relationship with God and people. 
Does that make sense? Well, let me ask you this. Do you believe for a second? Do you believe God's plan for your life is to develop a plan through luck and charm, emptying it out with nothing to show for it? Let me say this, not even slightly. He desires to prosper, that's thrive, prosper you in the goodnesses, hope. In goodness is hope, excuse me. Where all thrive, not only as individuals, but collectively, together through His outstanding design. God's design, plan, if you will, guarantees a remarkable fate or destiny that is predetermined just for you. And I promise, God has a plan for you just as He does for all people. You're with me this morning. Boy, you're quiet. Now today, our biblical character is, of course, Jeremiah. Where we are using the comic book character, Dr. Fate, from the DC franchise, if you know that particular character, for apparent reasons. Fate. Now, when we parallel the real and the fictional characters together, you'll see both in their respective roles, meaning one is an actual character, a real character, and the other one is imaginary. But in their respective roles, in the sense of how storytelling happens, both act against the forces of evil caused by the chaos and disorder of the people. Now, with the actual character, Jeremiah, not a fictional character, a real character, when reading the longest book in the Bible... Named after him, Jeremiah is the longest book in the words-wise, not chapter, that would be Psalms, but word-wise, there's no bigger or longer book than the book of Jeremiah. So when reading that, you see Jeremiah in his place, especially up front in the story, is in place to clean up all the chaos and disorder God's lucky and charming people caused because of their chance way of living in their deceptive and charming ways. It's black and white in the book of Jeremiah. And just as we're experiencing in our day and age, Jeremiah dealt with false religion and people who refused to trust in the Lord's plan in the long run. It's sad indeed. Now, God's people back then were guilty of evil and idolatry living in their homes, in, in, in their churches, and in their communities. I'm talking about God's people here. And the fate of Jerusalem's destruction was inevitable. Because God's people fell into their foolish ways and refused to delight in the Lord's plan. Who's with me? We see this story because what had happened with God's people, they have become they became foolish in understanding God's word. And we know what the word of God says when it comes to fools. Proverbs 18, 2, 2 makes it very clear where wisdom says this: fools find no pleasure. And understanding. But delight in airing their opinions, their viewpoints. And there's much conversation going on today that, well, everybody has their point of view. I understand that. But I hope your point of view is connected to the ultimate point of view of God. If it is not, you are missing the mark. You are a fool if you don't go seek after that. I'm not preaching that. The Bible is the word of God. So again, fools find no pleasure in understanding. What do they find pleasure in? Their ways, their habits, their whatever. But delight in airing their own opinion. Passive communication. Blah, 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 blah. God, God. The four friends of Job should come to mind. Or the three friends of Job. Right? Oh, you're a sinner. You're bad. You're no good. Thanks for that. That really helps. You know. Oh, you need to learn more Bible and all this. And it's like... Shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. As God said in Job chapter 42, if you know the Scripture. 
Now here is the unfortunate part in, in Jeremiah's story. Day after day, week after week, month after month, etc., etc., Jeremiah preached and taught the love and justice of God in the hope of getting God's order and design back into place. Back in a place to be the light or expression of God's plan, anticipating an outstanding return for the people. However, if you know the book of Jeremiah, it never happened. Because the people continue to live through their um, onslaught of Babylon's luck and charm. If uh, Babylon in the book of uh, in the Bible is just referred to as a world system. In fact, the Bible says it was a great city, and we go, "Oh, it's a great city." No, it's a great city of sin, missing God's play. So, uh, on the uh, they continue to live on the onslaught uh, uh, ons- onslaught <laughs> onslaught is what I'm trying to say of. Uh, Babylon's luck and charge, uh, char- charm. Uh, this lucky charm religion, if you will, because we're talking about people, uh, God's people living in all this and, and falling into it. So this lucky charm religion, the world's method of faith, if you will, eventually destroyed God's people and the temple and the entire community of Jerusalem. Leaving God, good people in the smoldering ruins of secular ways of thinking and practicing religion. Who's with me? Now, isn't it ironic that our day mirrors Jeremiah's day? Nothing much has changed, which is sad because this is the old promise. We're in the new promise, promise, and we've seen the faith, and we still don't have good faith. We're still living out as they did back in Jeremiah's day. It's sad because we get to see. We've seen it through Jesus. They didn't get to see the Messiah. But here we are because people lack faith. Even when they see it, they don't believe it. And so it's quite ironic where we live today. Nothing much has changed. And today, most in the church fall into a secular way of thinking and have a wrong world view. A world view in terms of the world's religion without a clue in how to live naturally towards God's religious way. Are you with me? I said naturally there. You see, the average Christian today lives by luck and charm, meaning they don't seek understanding. God's way. They might seek it their way or however that is, but they don't seek understanding. Proverbs 18.2 should come to mind. They prefer to gain their appearance of being holy. I look good today, don't I? My pink shirt. They, pro- they, they prefer to gain their appearance of being holy from those who air their opinions or are charming in, in their appearance or looks and flattering in their words, meaning they tickle your ear rather than hearing what you need to hear, people who's with me. You see, the average Christian today, uh, religion, if you will, is based on luck and charm, if you think about it. The problem is today's Christian, they like it. It feels so good. Can you tickle my ear and make me feel good? They like it just as Eve liked it as she took the toxic fruit that caused the fall in her life and in our life if we're not careful. They, the Christians, take it in. uh, As John just (laughs) said, Good object lesson over here. Eat it up (laughs) and fall into the pits of emptiness. And another word for emptiness and aloneness is hell. The nothingness, faith, if you will, similar to the fate that we see in Jeremiah's day. A day where people exit the faith in a breeze or smoke or rattlesnake and destroy God's plan without thinking about it. All in the name of religion. Bad religion, that is. Most think, in the sense of our faith, 
this is sad. Most think life is all bad. That people are rotten to the core. You don't know my life, Pastor Drink. All oh, people are rotten. Thank you for your catastrophic thinking and your hyperboles and all that. Make a good preacher. But people, we believe people are all bad, rotten to the core, and, and life under the sun is bad. Bad, bad, bad. They say defining life their way rather than God's way, uh, which is a good way, good design. Who's with me? Now, with certainty in my voice this morning, let me say God, excuse me, God created people in his image with a plan that is good because God doesn't create junk and only desires good. Who's with me? Now, this morning, I want you to understand, Christian, those who are listening, uh, how wondrous and complex human beings are and how God has made them. And in true faith, we get this because people are created in the image of God. And this means that all people have incredible potential in how God created them and are naturally devoted or religious, we can say, to something or someone. Hopefully, it's God. Now, please understand that a part of God's creation in people, how we've been created in the image of God, is that they are naturally devoted and religious. Naturally. Are you with me? God has created you this way. Not only in our day, but in Jeremiah's day. It's how God created us. Or in other words, where you find people you naturally find religion. If you have people, you have religion. Who's with me? Now, let me say this. Religion is one of those terms that we all assume we understand. But few of us can define it, objectively speaking. Most err their opinion on the topic rather than seek proper understanding. It's important to understand, or we will end up as the people did in Jeremiah's day, in exile and in ruin. Now, let me say this. Summing up religion in one statement is quite challenging. So let's see if we can do it this morning. Religion. Good or bad, folks. Now, good religion comes only from what the Lord declares. Bad religion is put in by the institution that man creates. Yes? So religion, good or bad, comes down to three things. Belief, attitude, and lifestyle. Okay? Let me say that again. Belief, attitude, and lifestyle is what makes up religion and how you've been created. Think about it. All humans have beliefs, yes. All have attitudes, feelings or attitudes. And all have a lifestyle towards someone, something, or an object. Good night. Look at most people's life. I promise you they have a belief, uh, an attitude, and this lifestyle towards something outside of them. It could be their car. It could be money. It could be an object that sits uh, not where God is, but lower. Yes? Of course, in the true faith, we want that object of our faith to be God. And if we miss that mark, you're going to end up as the people did in Jeremiah's day. So then, religion is then defined as nothing more than belief, attitudes, and lifestyle, or a manner of living which, makes all, which then makes all humans naturally religious. Yes, even the atheist who believes in nothing, who has uh, a no good attitude toward God and lives a lifestyle where God does not exist in their reality. But notice, they all have belief, uh, an attitude, and a lifestyle towards that, which is their religion. It's religious in nature. It's impossible for humans not to be religious, even atheists, again, in their opinion, who claim no God at all. I shouldn't only say atheist, but what about the agnostic Christian? We won't go there today. 
agnostic means God exists somewhere, but you're living your life like He doesn't exist. So without a doubt, there are many religions. In fact, there are as many religions as there are people. So the question is, which one is declared to be true? Which religion is true? Why is ours much better than anything else? The only way to know for sure, folks, is to seek after the answer with all of your heart, mind, and soul and put the world's luck and charm, what you like, aside. You say luck and charm religion aside and do all you can to understand God's plan that guarantees that those beliefs that you gain, your attitudes and lifestyle will benefit the whole of life. And I challenge all to seek and and lean into finding such a religion. However, to save you a little bit of time, mark my words on this if you seek after it. When you're done seeking and, and leaning into it, you'll find there's only one religion that is true in its proper understanding that fits the criteria of wholeness, and that is to include all of eternity, conquering death. That is Christianity. Not Christianity and the brokenness of how people display or express express it oftentimes in how God declares it. The Lord declares it. Uh, It's a way of life, behavior, and style of living that meets all a person's needs in all of the person's dimensions, I don't have time to go there, but in God's reality and or his plan. Are you with me? How do we know this? And of course, this is the subjective word of God. Of course, we know this. John 14, 6, 7 gives us the direction that we need to at least pay attention to. Jesus answered, now I am the way. There's belief and truth. There's your attitude or reality and life, lifestyle. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no other human being you can go through. Your parents, anybody anybody in history, none. Challenge it. Now, it makes sense, right? Jesus Christ, in the sense of uh, uh, history, is the only one that can give slight evidence that you can survive, not survive, prosper. I almost used the wrong word there. Prosper after death. It's only Jesus, and there's evidence. But the atheist will come to me or, or the agnostic and say, well, it's, it's very little. It's only like 7%, Pastor. Well, how, how much evidence is it for the other faith? You thought about that? Zero. A reasonable person say, I'll bet on the 7% every time. Who's with me? <laughs> But we'd rather use luck and charm and gamble with that ultimate plan without even thinking twice about it. So Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. There's the perspective, ultimate belief, except through me. If you really know me now, there's the practices of Christ, the attitude that we all ought to have, the attitude of Christ, know me, you will know my Father that good perspective, that good attitude as well. And from now on, here's the Holy Spirit coming. From now on, as you move in this perspective, in these practices, these these beliefs and attitude, from now on, you know Him, the Father, and have seen Him through me and through the energy or movement or the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? That is... Something we have to look at and then challenge. Go ahead and challenge. Listen, I went to seminary. I had to do all this faith. And I've been trying. Uh, and then I've been studying people like C.S. Lewis, who was an atheist and decided to become a Christian because he actually studied it and went after it. And everyone that's done it, every one of them had become a Christian because they put true effort towards it and sought after the kingdom of God. Now, to be worthy of being called a Christian, one must adhere to to the teachings of Jesus. Not Paul, not Peter. Of Jesus. 
You go into a church who doesn't even mention the teachings. They, they preach on Paul. They preach on with Peter. And they, they're great teachers. But if they're not fi- uh, primarily teaching the, the, the teachings of Jesus, listen, you're in trouble. It's a wrong foundation. It's because only Jesus could give us that good perspective. Not God is good, you're bad, try harder. No, that's a bad perspective. God is good. He created you good. You've done some pretty screwed up things thanks to mom and dad and everybody else in your life. But listen, you can be born again and you can get a new perspective. It's up to you. Make the choice. That's the plan that God has to it. It's, it's, it's not about luck and charm and hopefully this just falls on us. Anybody ever met a Christian who says, well, I've always been a Christian? Ah, that's like saying I've always been pregnant. Which I know you think I am. That's been in Jerry's fault. <laughs> hey, but... <laughs> Listen, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense in the reason of faith, and even when you sense that, it doesn't make sense. So luck and charm doesn't happen in, in religion. It's about accepting Jesus as Lord, which means making Him the authority or controlling influence in, in your life, which by then we conduct our lives. Notice the word influence. If you're not being influenced by God, Jesus Himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Lord, then there's something in the garden influencing you other than God. Who can that be in the story of the garden? Hello, Mr. Serpent. So it is Jesus, God himself, who declares this plan, and we have to truly lean into it to understand what a fulfilled and true, uh, we can say righteousness in the standard of what, or the standard that we put in life. So in other words, all of our beliefs, attitudes, and lifestyle is to be in the framework of Jesus' reality. Not through luck and charm, but through good fortune and faith that directs God's plan to prosper and give hope to all ages. Are you with me? The question is now, just as I asked last week, will you decide to stop living life in faith as they did in Jeremiah's day by luck and charm? Where their false religion or I should say their false religious ways and short-term plans ended them in exile and destroyed the Messiah's intended direction for over 70 years. Are you with me? Everybody's looking at everybody's walking. (laughs) Pay attention here. This is important. Let me say this again. The question is, will you decide to stop living life in faith as they did in Jeremiah's day, which is guaranteed to put you in exile. And as I shared, they went in exile for 70 years and never came out of it. What is your decision today? Will you dispute the beliefs and attitudes and and lifestyle that continue to throw you into survival mode? And will you change or transform your life over to God's way of thriving? A thriving that guarantees God's plan for all eternity in His reality, sealing your fate for goodness. Again, the question is, will you? As we wrap up, let me ask again, back to our question. Do you have a short-term or a long-term dream for your life? Are your plans primarily based on luck and charm, osmosis, hoping it will happen? based on man's opinion or are they long term as the Lord declares ending where we began Jeremiah 29 11 very clearly again for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you hope and a future church Elevating Life Church that is the message lucky charm religion Amen.